For those of you who are just joining us, um, this is a crazy time in the world. Who would have ever thought we would be at this moment when uh, the whole world is living in fear and uncertainty. And uh, we are feeling fear and uncertainty here in the United States. You know, it's usually that our um, friends overseas are the ones that are feeling this. And um, uh, our government is often the one causing the problems, but we're not feeling the results immediately in our daily lives. And uh, here we're all feeling the same. And on the one hand, um, it's terrifying. On the other hand, it does give a sense that the the world is small. And because of that, talking about Iran and what the Iranians are suffering right now is so important to do. So Trita, we're really glad that you took time out of your busy, busy schedule. Um, we wanna thank the other co-hosts for joining us. And uh, I think we're gonna have a, a good audience today and it will be online for uh, you to tell your friends afterwards. Uh, Trita, you're the founder of the National Iranian American Council. Uh, and now involved in an exciting new venture, the Quincy Institute. Uh, I wonder if you want to say a word or two about that, and then we'll jump into what's happening in Iran. Sure. Thank you so much. And thank you to Code Pink and all the co-sponsors for organizing this. And I want to really commend you all for the work that you've been doing for the last two weeks, in particular, when it comes to lifting sanctions on Iran, which I see has gotten a lot of traction on Capitol Hill and hopefully will come to uh, uh, victory as well. Uh, the Quincy Institute was founded, uh, was launched late last year. It's a new think tank in town that, unlike most of the other think tanks in Washington, uh, is on the one hand transpartisan in the sense that we do have support from both the left and the right. But the most important aspect is that we are founded in order to rethink American foreign policy and question the first principles of American foreign policy. We want to shift the paradigm of American foreign policy towards a national security strategy that is centered on diplomacy and on military restraint, meaning far, far less military interventions than we have seen in the last 40 or so years. Um, and we're off to a good start. And I think with the coronavirus, it is a stark reminder to everyone that after spending all of this money and killing so many people against all of these kinds of threats from abroad, many of them highly exaggerated, Look how vulnerable we are to a pandemic. Look how unprepared we are for dealing with it. And look how our priorities are when it comes to how much money we're spending on um, healthcare and for uh, preparation for a pandemic like this and how much money we're wasting on all of these endless wars and all of these foreign bases right now. So jumping right into it, we wanted to uh, ask you to give us an update on uh, where things stand in Iran, uh, including with the uh, pandemic, but how does this change the correlation of forces inside Iran? And then we'll go into the US policy and the global level. Sure. The pandemic hit Iran not only very hard, but very early, uh, probably because of extensive contacts with the Chinese as a result of Trump leaving the nuclear deal, the Iranians have become more and more dependent on the Chinese, their economy in particular. So the connections there are very, very intense. And that's probably why uh, it, they were hit so quickly compared to other countries. The government clearly mismanaged the situation, continues in many ways to mismanage it, uh, partly as a result of a power struggle within the country between uh, the Rouhani faction and some of the more hardline elements. We saw just in the last couple of days that that fight had actually led to uh, the hardline elements telling the Médecins Sans Frontières um, that their help is, is rejected. And you saw the Rouhani government overruling that uh, and, and continuing to welcome the help from um, that organization and others as well. So you have on the one hand- Chris without borders, who, for those who don't understand the French. Oh, I'm sorry, yeah. Um, and. Um, uh, we see, you know, the continuation of how um, lack of preparedness, lack of taking it seriously. We see some parallels between what the Iranians did and what happened in this country, in the sense that the Iranians were notified that there's something happening. It's not entirely clear how well they understood the situation, but they decided to go forward with the parliamentary elections anyways, fearing that otherwise um, uh, it would be a propaganda 
um, uh, point for the West or particularly for the Trump administration if they had to postpone it. And we saw the same thing happening here in the United States with the DNC going forward with some of the primaries in the midst of, of this pandemic. Uh, so on the one hand, they've handled it very poorly and you have a very large number of cases, probably a very large undercounting of the cases as well as the undercounting of the deaths. Um, there's a lot of anecdotal evidence that many deaths that are corona related have been categorized differently, perhaps in order to push down the statistics. So um, how uh, able was the uh, healthcare system in Iran uh, to deal with people's needs before this happened? Well, under normal circumstances, their healthcare system is, is uh, not um, in a bad shape. Actually, it's quite good in many aspects. But as a result of the sanctions from the United States for the last couple of years, which have been immense, just to give you uh, a bit of statistics, before Trump left the nuclear deal, the Iranians were exporting roughly 2.2 million barrels of oil a day. Um, and that was um, uh, one of the main, if not the main source of income for the state. It is after all an oil country. As a result of the sanctions, the first round of it, when Trump re uh, refused to renew waivers for several different countries, this dropped down to 1.1 million barrels. Now, as a result of him essentially not renewing any waivers at all, the Iranians are most likely not exporting more than 260,000 barrels a day, which means a more than or roughly 90% reduction in the main export of that country. Now, imagine how that then spreads throughout the country and how that impacts the entire economy. You cannot do something like this and say, well, this will only affect uh, their military budget, or this will only affect the regime, but not the population. That is just pure uh, nonsense. It is preposterous. There is no case in history in which uh, a downturn of eco economy or a pressure of economy of this kind has happened that has not affected not only everyone, but primarily the weaker elements in society. And then you add to that the recent oil wars between the Saudis and Russia that has made the price of oil plummet. Uh, and so they're getting even less than they were before that. Certainly, and the budget of the country was based on a $50 uh, per barrel oil. Now it's below that and the Iranians are probably offering discounts in order to get anything sold, mindful of the risks that entails with buying oil from Iran, uh, mindful of the additional expenses for shipping and, and insurance that is taking place again as a result of sanctions. Uh, now, the administration, of course, claims that, hey, but, you know, medical equipment is not sanctioned. And as a result, this is nonsense. The Iranians are lying about this. That is clearly a disingenuous talking point from the administration because they know very well that by sanctioning the entire financial system and the banking sector in Iran, it doesn't matter whether a specific good is sanctioned or not. The transaction is already sanctioned. And it, if this wasn't the case, you wouldn't have seen some measures by OFAC earlier uh, this year in which they were trying to change some things to be able to claim at a minimum that they're doing something to ease uh, humanitarian trade. Um, uh, office of Foreign Assets Control. Yeah, the Office for Foreign Assets. That would not have been necessary had it not been the case that this is affecting the healthcare sector. And, you know, you don't have to take it from me or take it from other experts, Human Rights Watch itself issued uh, a report about a month and a half or so ago, I think it was, that documented how this very much is not only affecting um, the healthcare sector in Iran, but it actually is a violation of human rights. You also have international courts having ordered the United States to lift these sanctions because of the impact that it has on the healthcare sector. So the, um, the terrible situation of coronavirus in Iran has really led to uh, new calls throughout the world uh, for the U.S. to lift these sanctions. Can you say how things have shifted just in the last two weeks? Well, I mean, there's been an outcry, um, uh, an organized outcry, but also a very organic outcry because, I mean, how can you continue, and not just continue, impose new sanctions on a country in the midst of a pandemic? I mean, there's a... Um, 
level of inhumanity, I don't think we have the word for it yet. We have to invent a new word in order to be able to describe this. And in fact, it's even worse. I mean, under these circumstances, according to the New York Times, Mike Pompeo took the opportunity to go to the president and say, actually, this is a really good time to bomb Iran because they're already suffering so much under these sanctions and up under the pandemic. It's the perfect moment to do so. That's so our top US diplomat. The, uh, the Secretary of State, the very same guy who uh, essentially held up an agreement within the G7 on how to deal with this issue by insisting that all of the countries would have to refer to Corona as the Chinese or the Wuhan virus. I mean, He's where our priorities are on this is just absolutely grotesque. Isn't he the same one who also wanted the U.S. to hit back harder against the Iraqi militias that are aligned with Iran, uh, again, at this time of the coronavirus? Yes, indeed. Uh, I mean, there's been several occasions in the last 12 months in which a question has been, you know, an issue has come up to the table of the desk of the president and the question has been whether he would take military action or not. In each and every one of those instances, Mike Pompeo counseled war instead of other measures. And I think in many different ways, because of the presence of Bolton, at least up until a couple of months ago, a lot of attention was taken away, of, away from the very equal, if not worse, hawkish sentiments and instincts of Pompeo because he could just hide behind Bolton. Bolton had that ability of just saying the most ridiculous things publicly and, and getting all the attention to go to him. But in reality, based on the record, it does not seem as if Pompeo in any way, shape or form is better. In many ways, he may actually be worse. So is it actually the Pentagon that is a more moderating force in terms of any kind of military action? In that specific case and in earlier cases, that appears to have been the case, but we still have to take it um, with a grain of salt in the sense that, yes, I don't think there's a lot of folks in the Pentagon who wants to have war, but that is not the only issue. And this goes into the work that we're doing at Quincy. It is not as if the Pentagon is pushing back against the idea that the United States needs to dominate the world militarily. And particularly when it comes to dominating the Middle East militarily, taking the side of the Saudis on many of these different issues. Because that approach in and of itself constantly puts the United States on the verge of war, not just with Iran, but with other countries. It's a very aggressive foreign policy. So as long as that policy still has more of a consensus within the government, the fact that some of these elements at the last moment counsel against war, which is obviously good, but it's not good enough. We need to fundamentally review our foreign policy so that we're not constantly in this position in which the question of war keeps on coming up. Now, in terms of the uh, crux of the supposed crux of the issue around the nuclear deal, um, you wrote a piece that said this might be a time when hardliners in Iran are saying, uh, let's go for the bomb. Can you explain uh, your analysis there? So I published a piece over the weekend that pointed out that uh, there's some significant changes taking place in Iran. I mean, the hardliners are on the rise. Trump has completely humiliated those in Iran who argued in favor of diplomacy with the United States, who argued in favor of some form of reconciliation and modus vivendi between the US and Iran who saw the nuclear deal as just the beginning of a larger process in which other issues between the two countries would be dealt with as well diplomatically uh, with the aim of coming to a, a resolution. Um, they've been all proven wrong essentially in the eyes of most Iranians right now because the nuclear deal has not delivered in any way, shape or form for them. In fact, Iran is under more sanctions now than it was before it signed the nuclear deal. Iran is under more sanctions now when it is abiding by a nuclear deal than when it was accused of having violated the NPT. It is as bizarre of a situation as you can imagine. So under those circumstances, the argument of the hardliners that you know the mistake of the Rouhani government was that they actually believed that a deal with the United States could be struck and that you could trust the US to implement it. You know, hardliners warned already during the debate of the nuclear deal that the US is gonna betray this agreement and stab Iran in the back. And in the eyes of many, it seems like that argument, that line has been vindicated. Now, these forces are now rising in Iran. We saw what happened in the parliamentary elections. It's likely gonna repeat itself in the, in the presidential elections in Iran next year. Meaning the hardliners getting the upper hand. 
They're going to get the upper hand and probably win the presidency as well. And uh, the likelihood is that they're going to be pursuing a much, much more hawkish line than what the Rouhani government has pursued. I mean, they're still sticking to the nuclear deal. They're trying to see if the Europeans can uh, come in and aid them. Um, and in that circumstance, there's also now uh, rumors and murmurs that the debate and the conversation inside the regime itself has changed in the sense that the argument in favor of leaving the NPT or building a bomb was a very, very, very small minority within the regime. And this is corroborated by US intelligence, European intelligence, even Israeli intelligence, who all agree the Iranians never made a political decision to build the bomb. Um, and certainly leaving the NPT would be a massive step, but also dashing for a bomb would be a massive step as well. And I've not seen any indications that early on they had the intent or the desire to go in that direction. Now it appears that things may be changing, that the conclusion for the Iranians are that if they only had the bomb or if they at least left the NPT and used that as leverage, they might be in a more similar situation as with the North Koreans. And we've seen how Trump is treating the North Koreans compared to the Iranians. Um, and the danger here is this. Pompeo thinks that uh, the coronavirus is making Iran very, very weak and in disarray. And I think he's actually correct in that. It is making Iran much weaker. But the coronavirus is a sword that cuts both ways. Because at the end of the day, it's also spreading global chaos. And it may actually also provide the Iranians with opportunities that they earlier on did not desire nor need. Now, however, with the coronavirus, with the additional pressure from the United States, the hardliners may come forward and say, well, this is actually the best moment to withdraw from the NPT, kick out all the inspectors, and dash for a military bomb. What is the United States going to do? It's going to be dealing with its own coronavirus, its own elections, the international community doesn't have an appetite for uh, a conflict with Iran under these circumstances. And as a result, see this as a, a small opportunity within a larger crisis. This is very dangerous in my view. I think it would be very bad if the Iranians got a nuclear bomb. It would be very bad to see further um, proliferation of nuclear weapons. And none of this would be happening had it not been for Trump doing this huge, huge disfavor to US national security by pulling out of the nuclear deal and starting to wage economic warfare against Iran. Well, I'm glad you uh, went back to that because it's so important for people to understand that this is a manufactured crisis and also how much it's affecting next door in Iraq. Uh, we're just uh, this week, we see US soldiers, uh, two US soldiers killed and a British soldier uh, in an attack, how much of, the, of those attacks are, do you think, really directed by Iran? And how much is there really a danger of uh, this, what's been called a tit for tat, I don't, I don't like to use those terms because it's people's lives, um, turning into a much larger conflict? Uh, we don't know for certain how much control the Iranians have, the US intelligence believes that some degree of control that they had probably has been lost as a result of Soleimani, uh, Qasem Soleimani being assassinated by the United States. Uh, we also know that even if the Iranians were completely against any of these actions, the Iraqis have themselves their own incentives to do what they're doing because together with Soleimani was also the head of one of these militias, Mohandas, uh, who was killed. And there is likely a desire among some of those Iraqis to avenge his death. And uh, we don't know if they're acting completely independently or not. Now, Pompeo thinks that if they do something, the US should target Iran. Both the military as well as Trump himself pushed back against that, knowing very well that that would lead to a major military confrontation of full scale war. But the question, that we also have to ask ourselves is that the Iraqis have now asked the US to leave. The fight against ISIS is something that Iraq, together with the help of a couple of other countries, can handle on its own. The United States is not needed there any longer. Why is the United States staying when the fight against ISIS, according to the president, is over? The Iraqis are asking the US to leave. Why do we still have troops there that essentially are just a tripwire? If some Iraqi militia completely independently from Iran chooses to attack those US troops, the US may end up in a war with Iran. And now we have, because of coronavirus, a lockdown of US troops. Uh, 
uh, that will not be leaving anywhere they are uh, for the next, what is it, three more months? Except from Afghanistan, that withdrawal appears to still be taking place. Mm -hmm. So uh, in our remaining uh, le less than 10 minutes at this point, let's move towards uh, the international scene, what uh, people are calling for, how uh, this growing chorus, both outside the US and within the US might be used as a time to uh, really get some kind of lifting uh, or partial lifting of the sanctions. I mean, it's been interesting. You see the spokes, you know, the EU foreign policy chief, uh, Borrell, um, explicitly blaming US sanctions for the devastation and disarray in Iran when it comes to the coronavirus, saying that it's made the situation much, much worse. You have the Pakistani prime minister on Twitter urging the United States uh, to lift sanctions. You have the Brits privately lobbying Trump to lift the sanctions. They're not doing it just out of a sense of humanity, which of course is very critical, but I think they're also doing it out of a sense of self-interest, particularly if you're sitting in, in Pakistan. You're not gonna be safe if the coronavirus can fester in Iran. In fact, if the virus can fester anywhere, it will be a threat to everywhere. That is the reality of these pandemics and these uh, viruses. So as a result, seeing the United States and the Trump administration imposing more sanctions in the midst of the pandemic is something that is not just seen as inhumane by a lot of countries, including close U.S. allies, but is also something that is seen as a danger to themselves. So there are, um, because of the uh, lack of revenues that the Iranian government has and because of these uh, new needs now, uh, to fight this pandemic, they have gone to the IMF and asked for a loan of $5 billion. Can you say where that stands now? And uh, can the U.S. actually veto that? The U.S. can veto that. They've signaled that they're going to veto that. And that's also something that the Europeans have pushed back against. This is a specific loan that was announced just a couple of weeks ago for countries to be able to get help in order to deal with the virus. And the idea that the United States actually would specifically block a loan aimed for the virus by the IMF tells you how disingenuous the administration is when they're saying that nothing they're doing is actually impacting the medical sector in Iran. It clearly is. It clearly is intended to, because you would not have a scenario in which Pompeo would argue this is a great moment to bomb Iran if he didn't want to see this degree of disarray inside the country. These sanctions are not as a side effect affecting the medical uh, sector in the country uh, and the population so negatively. That is the intent. It is not a byproduct. It is not a bug. This is what always happens and what is the intent of broad scale sanctions. In fact, the theory behind it is that once the population as a whole is under that amount of pressure, they will pressure their government to change the policies in order to get rid of those sanctions. That's the entire thinking behind the very idea of sanctions. So uh, just to play out that scenario, uh, there are people in the US government that are always saying the government of Iran is about to topple, about to topple. And now there are those who say, uh, this is just uh, going to uh, force an explosion in Iran. Uh, if Indeed, the government were to topple at this point in time, what would happen? Well, I mean, that's the other thing that is kind of interesting. We don't have a lot of cases in history in which sanctions as a result of economic warfare get toppled or, or collapse. But I do believe that that is part of the intent behind this, that they are not so much looking for regime change as they're looking for regime collapse, meaning the U.S. doesn't have any responsibility for what comes afterwards, which means that it can just wash its hands and then see the chaos in Iran essentially consume that country. And this is the idea of it before the pandemic. Post-pandemic, obviously, the situation is 100 times worse. And this is part of the fear that a lot of pro-democracy uh, defenders and activists in Iran have, that as much as they are opposed to the government, they're opposed to the repression of the government, the mismanagement and the corruption of the government, seeing the country's state um, and central authority completely collapse will only lead to chaos. And democracy does not tend to come out of chaos. Uh, in fact, it rarely comes out of chaos. And as a result, under these circumstances, 
where you clearly need a central authority in order to be able to uh, make sure that the pandemic is defeated and that the, core, uh, the virus is uh, isolated and contained. And we can make a parallel to the United States, which uh, has uh, a tradition of having a lot of this authority be delegated to the states and, and more local services. We see how uh, chaotic that is compared to a South Korea that has a very strong state and I can impose a statewide response very quickly. Well, if you don't have a state at all, imagine what will happen then. So that brings us back to what uh, can we do in the US and uh, there are uh, some letters, uh, there, there's some a movement within Congress, not much, not enough, but can you say what is happening and what can we do? I think what several of these organizations, Cold Bank, NIAC, and uh, others have done is absolutely fantastic. The leadership shown by AOC, Bernie, Ilhan Omar, and others in taking the lead on this is absolutely needed. This is not going to be a quick fight. The, the pressure here has to keep on building up. If it wasn't effective, you would not have had editorial uh, pages on the Wall Street Journal and others arguing, please don't lift the sanctions even for a pandemic. They're only writing this because they do understand that what is happening right now and the continuation of the sanctions and the efforts by these different groups and lawmakers is really uh, undermining the support for this ridiculous and inhumane sanctions policy at this point. My hope is also that this will really wake us up, not just in the case of Iran or Venezuela or others, but also for us to really rethink this idea of sanctions. It has been presented and oftentimes on Capitol Hill, you see that a lot of folks, a lot of folks that are on the right side of most issues, I would say, still have a tendency of viewing economic sanctions as an alternative to war. But it's important to understand that economic sanctions, particularly broad based economic sanctions, actually are war. They're not an alternative to war. And the academic literature also shows that they oftentimes lead to military war afterwards. So uh, after we say goodbye to you, Trita, Ariel is going to stay on for a while with those who can stay with us just to talk a bit more about what we can do. Uh, but before you leave us, uh, is there anything else that we haven't covered that you would like to uh, say? Uh, I would just like to thank Code Pink and all of your supporters and all of the grassroots that are following your work and engaging your work, the mobilization you all have done in favor of uh, lifting these sanctions and making sure that our response to the coronavirus in Iran and elsewhere is not just gonna avoid putting civilian populations there under threat, but also make sure that it doesn't do anything that puts the United States itself under threat uh, or US personnel that are around the region very close to these different places. So thank you so much for all of that. Thank you. And I just wanted you know, we had a tremendous response to uh, your coming on. We have other groups like uh, Pax Christi, Peace Action, co-hosting Metro D uh, DC for the Democratic Socialists of America, Popular Resistance, World Without War. Uh, and uh, we all thank you for uh, thank the you. work that you're doing. And uh, we look forward to continuing to work with you and uh, figuring out ways that we can put enough pressure on our government uh, to stop these sanctions and move back to where we were under the last administration, uh, which is uh, into a normal relationship with Iran so that people inside Iran can determine what kind of government they want. Thank you so much for all you do. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you. So Ariel, you have been doing a lot of work in the last couple of weeks, well, the last years, and you've been to Iran recently. Um, so maybe you can uh, follow up with what you heard from Trita, anything you wanna add, uh, as well as uh, what is the work that is being done? What can people do? What are you watching or listening to in the chats or questions that you might wanna let everybody know about? Well, it's been devastating to watch what's happening in Iran right now with the coronavirus after having been there recently and met people there. And to say I worry, you know, daily about people's safety and the medical care because of the sanctions. Even before these sanctions, many life saving medicines were being blocked from the country. It is heartening to see right now 
voices from around the world, countries and organizations, even the New York Times today, calling for sanctions to be lifted. And this is fairly new. We've been working on this and struggling against this. So one of the exciting things right now is that many of the people watching and with us here on Zoom right now have likely been emailing Congress both recently and for a year and more asking for Congress to speak out, to do things to get these sanctions lifted. And there has been a response. A number of members of Congress, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, Bernie Sanders, Ayanna Presley, Ilhan Omar, Elizabeth Warren, and others have released a letter to the White House calling for the sanctions to be lifted. And if you go to our website, codepink.org, and I'm also going to show that page, then you can contact your member of Congress and ask them to add their names to this. Well, I'm trying to go to that page, but that looks like it isn't happening. So um, that's fine. Um, but if you go to codepink.org, you can contact your member of Congress directly. You can send them an email and say, please add your name to the AOC, Bernie Sanders, and more letter calling so for the sanctions to, to be lifted. Uh -huh. Codepink.org. You'll see it right on the top of our website at codepink.org. And you can also, after you sign that, it will direct you to a petition that is uh, over 11,000 signatures right now to the World Health Organization and to the Secretary General of the United Nations asking them to speak out and call for these sanctions to be lifted. This is so urgent. So uh, that is an action that um, is important to take. And the other thing, if you're watching and not signed up to our website, um, we'll put out future actions. I also recommend people uh, go to the National Iranian American Council and sign up for theirs, uh, as well as a number of groups that are the co-hosts. And we uh, listed the co-hosts for today in the chat box if you want to see that. And all of them have been doing work on this issue uh, and are great groups to be part of. Uh, it's um, pretty amazing how many groups are getting into gear doing this uh, in-house kind of education and organizing. And in lieu of being together, usually Code Pink, we would be working right out of the uh, Rayburn Cafeteria in Congress right now. So uh, as we're doing this virtual education and lobbying, uh, we hope you'll stay in touch with us. And before we close this out, Ariel, is there anything else you wanted to add? Well, I wanted to say that people are also calling the Treasury Department and that we encourage you to do that. You can look up their number because I don't have it at my fingertips, but I encourage you to call the Treasury Department and ask them to lift the sanctions. And I see that Medea is pulling up that number for us right now. I know Medea well, and I know how quickly she does that. And so maybe as we're ending this call, before we end it, we can have everybody type that number into their phone, but not yet push uh, dial until we get off. And then they can call the Treasury Department and ask them to lift those sanctions. This is such a time for our world to be coming together and in the midst of this horror, uh, watching this worldwide, there are these silver linings that we see how important it is for us to come together as one world. We see how important it is not to be tearing each other apart, destroying entire regions of the world, but instead to be building global health and safety. And this opportunity in the midst of everything that is so horrific right now, to move towards that world that we want to be. Medea, did you get that number? Well, I see a couple of different numbers. Um, 
but uh, I think I can pull it up actually. Okay, and while you're doing that, um, <clears throat> just a couple of other things. Um, we have put together a number of wonderful films on Iran that people can watch while you're home if you wanna uh, learn more and you can go to the Code Pink website to get a list of those. Um, you can also uh, send um, uh, uh, work, um, oh, here. Oh. I've got that number. Okay. So yeah. everybody get your phones out. The number is 202-622-2000. I'm going to put that in the chat box as well, as well as a little script for you to say. Tell them what city you're from, that you are gravely concerned about US sanctions, especially in this time of the coronavirus pandemic, and that these sanctions need to be immediately lifted. Great. Well, thank you, everybody, for joining us. We will have uh, this available on our uh, Facebook uh, for anybody who wants to go, go back over what was discussed or uh, send it to your friends to watch it. Uh, Trita is, I would think, the uh, one of the best analysts in the United States on Iran. Uh, we were very lucky to have him on, and we're very thankful to have all of you joining us today. And it will also be on YouTube. And for everybody who signed up through Code Pink's website for the webinar, so we have your emails collected, we will send out the link to uh, the YouTube recording so that you can send it around. Great. Thank you.